Yeah. Hello. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I would like to welcome you to our Symposium Diversity and Cultural Inclusion in the New Music Canon. My name is Jörg Süßenbach. I've been the director of the Goethe Institute here in Boston for about a year. And before that, I was the head of the music department at the Goethe Institute in Munich. There, in my formal function, I helped initiate a project called a post-colonial research with Clemens Thomas of Ensemble Research, which under the curatorial direction of Bongani Ndondana Brain and Elisa Erkelens brought together 10 composers from the so-called developing countries for an artistic exchange with the musicians of Ensemble Recherche. Arriving here in Boston, I quickly realized that the topic of diversity in the arts and especially in music is also of considerable importance here. And so we were excited to take advantage of Ensemble Recherche's Harvard residency to organize an event based on their experience with the post-colonial research project with additional international perspectives. It was just as important for us to engage in conversation with creatives here in New England to learn from their projects, perspectives and experiences. Why is this important to us? As an internationally active cultural institution representing a country with a colonial history, the Goethe Institute has long promoted critical discourse on the effects of colonialism and ideas about what a post-colonial world might look like. When applied to visual arts and its institutions, important issues arise such as the need to determine the future of cultural objects from the global south and german museums to question the power of european cultural institutions and to recognize the dominating tendencies of western cultures when it comes to the worldwide dissemination of cultural production the field of music also brings up many questions for example how to decolonize music in particular when considering the historical and contemporary classical music traditions of Central Europe, which dominate over other regions and genres and are too often mistaken as being aesthetically superior. I'm sure others will come up during this symposium. Since these topics are very complex and can be assessed from many different perspectives, it was important to us that we develop the program for this symposium together with a steering committee consisting of international experts. The final program includes two online panels, an internal think tank workshop with Boston-based and Ensemble Recherche musicians, and a concert with the Ensemble Recherche. We will start right now with this opening panel in which more fundamental international developments in the field will be presented and discussed from different positions. Tomorrow at 11 a.m. local time, things will get a bit more specific when the three ensembles, Castle of Our Skins from Boston, ICE from New York and Ensemble Research report directly on their experiences and strategies in this field. And the post-colonial research project, which inspired the symposium, will also be examined in more detail. Also online on our website, we are building a showcase with works by ensembles from Boston and beyond linked to this theme. Tonight, there will be an analog think tank workshop at the Goethe Institute Boston here, which brings members of the ensemble research together with representatives of various local ensembles. Here, performers and composers in particular can exchange ideas directly and possibly develop ideas for further strategies. A summary of this exchange will be published online as well. The concert on Tuesday night featuring the Ensemble Research and their post-colonial research project is in person at the Goethe Institute Boston. Recordings of selected works will be added to the showcase at a later date. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone involved. First of all, my wonderful colleague, Annette Klein, 
who has done a fantastic job as a program curator in Boston for the past 15 years and has been instrumental in setting up and running this series of events, but also our partners from the steering committee like Ashley Gordon, the artistic director of the Castle of Skins, Clemens Thomas, Clemens, congratulations to your 30th birthday today. <laughs> Thank you so much that you're, you're with us. Um, and Pungani, who also will moderate this panel, but also to all the participating musicians, composers, and ensemble representatives who will share their experiences with us. Thank you so much. A few words about the panel, which follows now. You are very welcome to write questions or comments in the chat, which we will pass to the panel later, especially in the last third of the panel. So now I'm really looking forward to your interest and to the next two days. But now let's start and let me introduce you to Bongani and Dodana Brain, the moderator of our first panel. Bongani is a composer from South Africa and has written a wide range of music, compassing symphonic work and opera, for example, He's the composer of Winnie the Opera based on the life of Winnie Mandela. He graduated uh, with a PhD in composition from Rhodes University and was appointed to fellowships at the Radcliffe Institute of Harvard and the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale. Bongani's research and creative output as a composer engages with diversity and inclusion in classical music. His compositions draw heavily from African music techniques and aesthetics in a quest to broaden cultural dialogue and classical music beyond its historic Eurocentricity. Now, I want to hand over to you, Bongani. Thank you so much for taking this moderation. Thank you so much, Jorg, and uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, in my case, I'm in South Africa. Um, we have a very interesting panel um, lined up with um, colleagues. Um, one is uh, John Sipayamanat and uh, Harold Kisidu. Um, there are biographies of their extraordinary work online on the Goethe Institute, but um, I will just read John's bi biography just briefly before he makes his, uh, his presentation. Um, he was born in Undan uh, uh, in Thailand, um, and, and he's an intercultural, um, a multi-instrumentalist composer, researcher, and music educator based in the greater Louisville and uh, Kentucky area. Uh, as a biracial Thai American with musical uh, families on both sides of the world, he has been navigating musical code switching and bimusicality for much of his life and uses that experience to inform his understanding of how music ecosystems interact, hybridize and create systems of exclusion. Um, John um, is also um, you know, in the public domain in terms of broadcasting, uh, having recently done um, a program for BBC Radio 3 um, uh, in London uh, around these issues. Um, John, over to you. Thank you, Bangani. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you to the uh, Goethe Institute and uh, I am so pleased to be able to speak with all of you. Um, so diversity, yes, that's a it's it's a very interesting word and very, very much kind of a catchphrase nowadays. And I think as far as what we're looking at in the US, it's it depending on the region, it's 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 approached a little bit differently. And obviously the types of ensembles and organizations uh, approach it very differently. And it's, it's become so much more present because of recent events, political events in the US, uh, whether it be the Black Lives Matters or uh, the, uh, the rise of uh, Asian hate crimes. And so I think it's been much more, it's been more important to bring some of these issues to the fore, especially as it relates to classical music and how different types of classical musics are excluded. And I use the term classical musics because we have this idea that classical music is this uh, narrative that comes only from Europe, but a lot of my research actually 
looks at the colonial effects of classical music and how it's been used as an assimilative tool uh, in, in colonies all around the world. And uh, whether it be used like in the enslaved orchestras uh, where enslaved peoples from different parts of the world would be forced to play it or where we have uh, indigenous peoples in those various countries that have been forced to learn how to play classical music in, in schools that were designed specifically for them. So I think that's a part of the history we don't get to hear a lot about in classical music, but it also means that there's a lot of repertoire and a lot of styles, uh, a lot of types of ensembles that come out in classical music in those parts of the world that we don't also hear about and also do not get included into the Western canon. So the idea that there's several different kinds, several classical music, I think is a very important idea um, to, to highlight and, and emphasize because that helps us to understand how new music, of course, is being composed in different parts of the world. So um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of things that are happening in, in the US and, and then some of my research on looking at curricula in, in different countries, especially in Southeast Asia and in my native Thailand. And uh, just to give a, a sense of how music is now being approached from the diversity and inclusivity standpoint. Um, one of the interesting uh, programs that I've uh, come across recently, and this is uh, done by Rena Esmail, who is uh, who is a South Asian composer, South Asian American composer, sorry, I need to make sure that we have the, the, uh, the American part in there, because uh, she was actually born in Chicago, and she started this uh, organization called Shastra, which is actually created to create a dialogue between Hindustani and classical music. And so the idea is that there are, she uh, has workshops that she does for Western musicians and, and Hindustani singers to come together and work and compose new works in, in a sort of a hybrid style. And, and then they have uh, audience outreach things. And I think uh, most of their workshops, the big workshops happen in LA. Um, and the idea is that we have these two great classical music traditions that aren't necessarily um, a part of each other's traditions, but uh, she wants to bring them into dialogue with each, other, with each other. And of course, this is a way for her to explore her own cultural background and cultural heritage, uh, much, uh, much like I do with mine in my composition. And I think that's also very important is that now that we have so many um, biracial, mixed race, or immigrants in, say, the U.S., a lot of these composers will be approaching classical music from a much different standpoint than your, uh, I don't want to say typical, because that, that sort of normalizes that there is only one type of classical music, so, but at least the mainstream of classical music. Um, and so there is that strand and there are a lot of our organizations around the country that do this kind of thing or are starting to do this kind of thing, uh, bringing in different cultures, uh, cultural musics into con uh, contact and dialogue with each other. Um, and this, uh, this is sort of a sidebar, but intercultural orchestras, intercultural ensembles are becoming much more common. And they, uh, like the Vancouver in, uh, Intercultural Orchestra in Canada, they actually have a program where the musicians will work with schools uh, and, and students, young students, like fifth grade, I think through, through high school, um, on teaching them how to compose for like, say the oud or the arhu or different types of uh, instruments that you wouldn't normally think about as being a part of the compositional world of Western classical music. And I think this is wonderful and this is happening much more often. And it also ties into the fact that there are actually composition traditions all around the world, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Um, another thing I want to talk about, though, is right here in my area, uh, the Louisville Orchestra. Some of you may know about the, the orchestra because of their long history especially with new music in the 50s and 60s with the uh, the first edition recordings. I think they premiered uh, well over 200 works or 
yeah, I think over 200 works and then recorded 150 of those uh, and were was one of the first orchestras to have their own recording label. And then some of these works have never been recorded since. So th these are the only recordings of many, many works. And so there's this, this huge legacy uh, with the Louisville Orchestra and new music. But recently, just this year, they started what they, they're calling the Creative Core. And it's basically a, a composer residency, um, though they're they're not specifically calling them composers because the idea is that they're not just composing music for an organization. The idea is that they're bringing these, um, I think, three every year for however many years they decide to do this program to do a residency, a year long residency in the Louisville area. So they are housing them, they are giving them health care, they are giving them a recording studio to work with, and they are allowing the composers then to obviously compose for the orchestra, but also work with the communities. And so one of the interesting things is, I'm going to read this from their uh, applicant profile. It's, um, they are, it says, they can be uh, fluent in comp uh, composing for orchestra forces, which of course is a natural, or be willing to collaborate with someone who is, which I think is interesting. And then, though, they need not necessarily come from a traditional Western classical background. And I think that's really, really important and kind of a game changer because there's, there's that recognition and acknowledgement that there are other ways of composing new music, right? And uh, this means that they don't necessarily have to be someone who works directly in the classical tradition, can work with someone to help with the arranging or the rehearsal of the, the musics. And this uh, ties into the whole idea that there are other composition traditions. And so um, this, this program is, is it's gotten a lot of buzz and I think it's really exciting and it'll be interesting to see where it goes. It just started in September. So we, uh, they've already premiered, uh, well, not premiered, but they performed some of the works on their uh, gala concert, the Louisville Orchestra of these three composers. And one of whom is actually a native of, of Louisville, Kentucky. So I think that's wonderful that this composer is able to come back and actually have a full-time job working with the community and in the community that he grew up in. So, um, so one of the things I do to help change this narrative, the, the idea that there are more than one types of classical music is, um, well, public musicology, I uh, have a, pu a public blog, which I write a lot of my research on uh, before, before they go off to press for possibly, uh, 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 you know, academic journals, because I think it's important for uh, not just the academics to read about this stuff and know about this stuff. Um, but the other, th one of the other things that I did is of course, uh, Bongan mentioned is the BBC classical, uh, world of classical program. It was basically a three part series where I explored different classical or art music traditions from all around the world. And then sort of did a comparative, uh, I don't want to say analysis, but at least did a comparison between how say like notation formed in different types in different parts of the country or, or rather world, sorry. Um, and in different traditions or say how large ensembles formed as a result of uh, changing political climates and, and, economic climates. So uh, I think we have we ha we have this, as was mentioned earlier, this this notion that classical music, Western classical music, at least, is the the height of of musical. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> the height of musical achievement, right? Um, but every major culture has had some sort of classical music tradition, uh, not necessarily at all related to what was done in the West, though sometimes in dialogue with it, especially through, like I said, colonialism. So I think understanding that th there's this colonial history in other countries outside of the West may help us to understand that composition that happens in those countries may not necessarily look like what it does here in the West. And then because of immigration, um, that means that we may actually find some of those even in, say, the U.S., where we have, I just had a rehearsal with my Balinese gamelan ensemble on Wednesday, and we played a composition written by uh, Mare Langsawan, who is uh, an Indonesian composer who teaches in Colorado, and, you know, a new piece of music for ba a Balinese gamelan. Uh, this is happening all over the world with different types of ensembles, whether it be chamber ensembles or solo instruments or full 
large ensembles like gamelan or say a traditional Chinese orchestra. I think there's over 200 gamelan uh, orchestras in the U.S. and that's you know that's a significant amount. Um, but if you start to look at all of the different ethnic groups and their large ensembles or their their chamber music, you you will start to find a lot of that out there. Anyway, I just thought I'd give that broad overview and um, things that need to be changed. I think creating initiatives like what the Louisville Orchestra has done is, is very important and hopefully more orchestras will start doing that because that would be great to have like every orchestra in the U.S. have a creator core and with with uh, composers that work within the tradition and outside of the tradition and then of course, funding structures are uh, an important issue um, because U.S. is very strange about how we get the arts funded here. Uh, and unfortunately, they do tend to favor Eurocentric uh, organizations. And that's that's a bigger issue and something that may be out of most of our control. But I think uh, understanding that the funding that does happen in the U.S. primarily does go to the large, well-established, uh, long, in many cases, organizations that have been around that tend to be very uh, Euro uh, European-centric or uh, classical music-centric. But um, I think I will, I think that may be enough because we'll have plenty of time to talk more. And if you have any yeah. questions, of course, that can come later. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, of course, you know, we have 20 minutes uh, after each of these presentations to discuss some of these things in much more detail. And um, uh, your piece on um, enslaved orchestra was particularly uh, instructive for me because I think there's a brief mention there of my part of the world, South Africa, and the orchestras that were enslaved, of, 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 of Mal Malaysian slaves that were here in, in South Africa. We move on now to Harold, uh, who is a historical um, musicologist. Uh, he received his doctorate from Columbia University, where um, he studied, of course, with the George Lewis, whom we're going to hear from tomorrow. Um, his research interests include um, Afro-diasporic classical and experimental composers, jazz as a global phenomenon, music and politics, uh, improvisation, transnationalism, and Wagner. Um, his biography is up on the, um, on the website, but just to add that um, he's currently working on a co-edited volume on um, Afro-diasporic composers of the world. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Bongani. I very much appreciate it. Before I begin, I would like to extend my gratitude to Jörg Susenbach and Annette Klein for inviting me to this panel. I very much appreciate you giving me an opportunity to provide my perspective on the issues we are discussing today. And I feel very honored to be part of this event. In my presentation, I will focus on a series of initiatives, some of which I have been involved in myself that have taken place over the course of the past four years, mostly in Germany. In 2014, Swiss broadcasting company SAF Eins in all seriousness asked if, quote, classical music has now reached black musicians. This is the discursive background against which a series of interventions took place that have addressed what is arguably one of music historiography's most glaring omissions, namely the virtual absence of a scholarly discourse surrounding the work of Afro-diasporic classical and experimental composers active since 1950 that also extends to the realms of concert programming and journalistic inquiry. A recent article in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung maintains that, quote, a large part of the history of music has so far hardly appeared in the established concert life. In the same article, famed baritone Thomas Hampson, who in 2021, together with Louise Toppin, curated the mini festival Song of America, a celebration of black music at Hamburg's prestigious Elbphilharmonie, characterized this unexplained absence this way, quote, there's a crime here, if I may put it that way. 
In the last few years, a slowly growing number of initiatives, such as the research project Defragmentation, curating contemporary music, which was supported by the Germany-based International Music Institute Darmstadt, the Donau-Eschinger Musiktage and Mads Music Festival for Time Issues, have begun to foster interventions addressing the erasure of Afro-diasporic classical and experimental composers and their contributions to contemporary music from musical historical narratives and concert programming. Countering what scholar pianist Dana Reason, speaking of women improvisers, called the myth of absence, a myth that also affects Afro-diasporic composers, transformative processes brought about the lifting of what composer and musicologist George E. Lewis has denoted as the cone of silence which has hung over the work. As Lewis, who in 2018 participated in two public defragmentation events and observed that by 2018, out of 4,750 compositions, only four works of Afro-diasporic composers had been performed at Darmstadt, has related about his activities, quote, thus at the defragmentation conference at Darmstadt, I moved to drive a large soundtrack right over the myth of absence and right through this glaring hole in the historiography of contemporary music by creating a listening slash viewing space in which a large screen video monitor, two channel sound system and comfortable seating and lighting invited visitors to experience a four hour sound and video loop consisting entirely of the work of Afro diaspora composers active since 1950. By doing so, I sought to provide a small example of how Black liveness matters and how music curators might actually do diversity by highlighting Black creativity in contemporary music as an international, multi-generational practice with important work coming out of North America, South America, Europe, the, the UK, Scandinavia, and Africa. The absence of Afro-diasporic composers from European concert programs became a point of departure for Afro-modernism and contemporary music, a concert and symposium which was curated by Lewis and took place in Essen and Frankfurt in November 2020. Featuring Ensemble Moderne under the baton of Bimbaye Kaziboni, the concert presented six world or German premieres of works by composers Alvin Singleton, Tanya Leon, Daniel Kidane, Hannah Kendall, the recipient of this year's Paul Hindemid Prize, Andile Kumalo, and Jesse Cox. An accompanying symposium, including the composers, curator Lewis, and additional experts, for which Lewis and myself gave the keynote, challenged fundamental assumptions about constructions of Western classical music as an historically and institutionally wide space, and critically interrogated the contemporary music world as a professional field that has systematically erased the presence and achievements of Afro-diaspora composers. This conception, of course, is at variance with musical historical accounts, substantiating Afro-diasporic music makers' presence in Europe and their contributions going back to the 12th century. Closer to our own day, Brooklyn-born composer Alvin Singleton, who lived in Europe between 1972 and 1985, was the recipient of the city of Darmstadt's Kranichstein Music Prize in 1974 and the Austrian Radio's Musikprotokoll Composition Prize in 1979 and 1981. Nonetheless, even today's contemporary classical music still seems to hold fast to what critical theorist Fred Moten identifies as, quote, a deeper, perhaps unconscious formulation of the avant-garde as necessarily not Black, end quote. For instance, with the exception of Elaine Michener's On Being Human as Praxis, which was premiered in 2020, the presence of Black composers at the Donau Eschinger Musiktag was exclusively confined to jazz identified musics. During the Afro Modernism on Contemporary Music Symposium, moderator Martina Taubenberger faced this issue squarely by asking the festival's then artistic director Björn Gottstein, quote, why are there so few composers of color who actually get programmed? What do you think are the reasons for this? 
Gottstein responded thusly, quote, contemporary music has always had this claim. We are avant-garde also in political questions. We are the best at getting rid of hierarchies. We can do that like no other art form can do it. And suddenly we realize we're actually sitting on the brakes of societal movements. You know, things are changing and we are not. We are being very, very conservative, very slow in adapting these things. And it's something that I find disturbing, I must say. Since 2020, I have been involved in a variety of endeavors aimed at counterbalancing what William Banfield has referred to as Black artistic invisibility, including a panel on identity, diaspora, and the contemporary, conceived as a run-up to the Ensemble Moderne's March 2021 performance of Afromodernism in Contemporary Music at the Berlin Philharmonic Hall, several interviews from major broadcasting networks and journals, and most importantly, a volume co-edited with George E. Lewis on Afro-diasporic composers of contemporary music. What I would like to emphasize is that my involvement in these projects was neither prompted by the urge to foster diversity within the field of new music, nor to expand its inclusivity. During the past few years, the inflationary use term diversity has morphed into a semi-corporate buzzword devoid of any specific meaning and has been co-opted by what philosopher Nancy Fraser has denoted as progressive neoliberalism. Accordingly, in a recent article published in the weekly German newspaper Die Zeit, the question about the Luzern Festival's 2022 model diversity was asked whether a renowned festival really wants to become more quote unquote diverse radically and sustainably, of, or if it just wants to be praised for its awareness. Moreover, as scholar Sarah Ahmed has observed in terms of the nexus between diversity and whiteness, quote, so if you move up, then you come to embody the social promise of diversity, which gives you a certain place. It is the very use of black bodies as signs of diversity that confirms such whiteness premised on a conversion of having to being. As if by having us, the organization can quote unquote be diverse. Diversity in this world becomes then a happy sign, a sign that racism has been overcome. I do not wish to conceal that the notion of inclusivity strikes me as equally problematic since it's predicated on a whiteness-based construction of the contemporary music world as a pan-European sonic diaspora with an inherent division between insiders and outsiders in which Afro-diasporic composers are conveniently cast in the role of the epistemological other. The co-edited volume on Black composers of contemporary music George Lewis and I are currently working on deploys for the first time a diasporic perspective on these composers and examines a Black, a black artistic tradition that is oftentimes assumed not to exist in contemporary expressive culture. Challenging the exclusive focus on corporate approved forms of Black artistic expression, which are reflective of a monolithic notion of the Black experience, one that is at variance with the complexity of Afro-diasporic lives, this collection engages with the full range of Black contemporary composers' ideas and aesthetic positions. In doing so, this collection brings together major figures in the field of contemporary music, such as Elaine Michener, Anna Kendall, Yvette Janine Jackson, Jane Forner, Alejandro Madrid, Scott Gleason, Andila Comalo, Julia Elizabeth Neal, and Jesse Cox. This volume relates much less to diversity, identity politics, or inclusivity, inclusivity than to the simple facts that to be deprived of the multiplicity of experiences, aesthetics, and practices of Afro-diasporic new music contributes to an impoverishment of the historical context, intellectual atmosphere, and listening experience of new music. The right and necessary time for this collection is now as issues such as the decolonization of classical music and the possibility of real changes to its identity matrix are widely debated in the public sphere around the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you um, very much, Harold. Um, there was just a brief question uh, about uh, who said the happy sign quote. Uh, if you can just briefly answer that. Oh yes, of course. So uh, the the I'm gonna I'm gonna um, put it in the chat. Uh, the scholar is um, Sarah Ahmed. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, very illuminating um, um, presentation. Um, now it's me as the moderator to make my uh, 10 uh, minutes uh, presentation. Um, my comments uh, are not um, you know, written down, but it's, it's more of a, some ideas I want to present uh, to the community, particularly from the uh, South African and the African perspective uh, on, um, on new music. Um, Africa, of course, has this history of um, colonization. Um, South Africa um, has a special kind of colonization that happened uh, with uh, the apartheid regime, which is basically a white supremacist government that uh, ran this country until 1994, um, when Nelson Mandela became president. Um, and it's basically uh, excluded black people from all spheres uh, of public life. Um, I have a quote that I would like to put up on the screen, uh, if we can, Annette. Um, can we put the quote up? Thank you. These two quotes um, basically anchor my, my discussion with you. Um, so you had the exclusion um, of Africans from uh, the cultural life of this country, especially education. And the quote at the top there is by then um, Minister of Native Affairs, uh, Hendrik Verwood, who became prime minister. And he's like the architect of apartheid. And it's just remarkable some of the thinking um, that went on here. Um, you can see the his his um, you know just his thinking around education of black people and basically access uh, uh, to culture was that there is no place for the Bantu, i.e., black people, in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. What is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it when it cannot use it in practice? Um, we can just stop sharing that for a second. Um, so that created, um, so, so apart from being the, apart, uh, the architect of apartheid, uh, Fervood championed something called Bantu education here, which again, um, um, I think uh, what was, the, uh, uh, was the system of education that was framed by that quote. Um, it took black people away from missionary, uh, these schools that were um, set up by the by German, British, uh, and, and then French mission, missionaries in Southern Africa. Um, that system came into effect in the 1950s. Prior to that, you had a lot of Africans who were either um, um, ministers um, uh, in, in the church, were also politically active, uh, were scholars and also were composers of, or performers. One, one, one example is, of course, the, the writer Saul Plaiki, who is known um, for his account of the siege of, uh, of, um, of Mafeking during, during the Boer War. Um, he was a violinist and he had been trained um, by, uh, in, in a German, mission, in German missionary school uh, to be a violinist. So by the time that the policies that uh, Favot uh, stood for um, in the 1950s came about, they closed down the missionary, uh, the missionary schools. And you find that with Bantu education, we did not have black people participating in the cultural life of the country. And also we didn't have a crop of black composers. Um, but before the uh, uh, inception of Bantu education, you had people like Michael Morane, um, who was, uh, uh, his um, nephew ended up being uh, Thabo Mbeki, the president of South Africa, who wrote orchestral music, for instance, because he had been through that missionary education system, uh, which is abolished by the likes of Fervod. 
not only um, was education um, restricted, but also access. Uh, I mean, for instance, people could not um, go to concert halls, etc. Uh, there's some scholarship that's been written, for instance, around um, the denial of access uh, of the of the uh, of black people in the Cape Town um, City Hall, where the orchestral concerts used to happen. How it was done gradually that you know blacks were only restricted to uh, the balcony, and there had to be like a separate ticketing system for them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so you have that history, and I think let's move on to the next quote I would like to present to you. We fast forward in time now to the 1990s. Um, can we have that quote, please? The slide up. Thank you, it's starting to load. So you had that generation of missionary educated um, uh, uh, black folks who were authors, composers, et cetera, even instrumentalists, and then you have the generation that um, was excluded through Bantu education. You find yourselves, we find ourselves now in, in the late 80s, early 90s, where South Africa is talking about a transition. And at this time, we have um, uh, this very powerful organization here in South Africa called SAMRA, the South African Music Rights Organization, which is basically a composer's organization, but also it's a copyright collection um, uh, agency that was uh, founded by an act of parliament. And, um, and the, they were trying to, uh, I think, find a way of how uh, uh, classical music uh, and, 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 uh, and African music can, can sort of like um, come to some sort of synthesis. And so the man uh, who was running Samra at that time uh, in the classical music department, Samuel Levy, sent out a question to all the South African composers asking like, is this ever gonna be possible? The, uh, the integration of African tradition and classical music. And there was a response from uh, one of the prominent Africana composers at the time, Hubert Duplessis, and that's the quote is there. And he says, I have always felt never the twain shall meet. In my personal opinion, the result will be a hybrid product of doubtful artistic standards. Interesting at best, but without grandeur. And in Afrikaans grandeur, the word is hate. Uh, Gershwin had a much easier task uh, compared to the South African composer. The jazz idiom of the American Negro is basically deeply rooted in the Western tradition. In this country, the black idiom is completely foreign to the Western musical tradition. Thank you so much. Uh, we can get rid of that uh, slide now. So South African composers um, had to face the issue of um, you know, not only exclusion in terms of education, um, but also uh, exclusion in the cultural space, and also this, this, these attitudes uh, of white supremacy that existed, that there is no way that African music can be integrated into the concert space. Um, and he quotes that, you know, only in America these things are possible, it's George Gershwin's music, et cetera. Um, and now, uh, sorry, I'm just going over time. I'm just going to wind up my comments by saying, so that's where South Africa comes from. Um, and, and now things are changing a bit with uh, composers of my generation. Um, and I think uh, Harold mentioned briefly Andy Le Pumalo, who is a, a pupil of, uh, of George Lewis, uh, did his graduate studies there at, at Columbia, uh, people like me and, and various others who uh, come out of the post-apartheid generation have been able to write uh, operas uh, and chamber music, et cetera. But that just gives you a background of where the South African situation comes from. I uh, hope it was not too lengthy. Um, and now I would like to open up the discussion to the panelists, the three of us who have a conversation. And um, I would first actually like to start with some of your comments, Harold. Uh, I wonder if you can expand a bit. Uh, you mentioned the erasure of Afro-diasporic composers um, from historiography and also their absence from programs in the concert hall. I mean, one clear and blatant example for me as an African is the um, electroacoustic composer Halim Eldar. Uh, who was doing that kind of, that, that kind of work before even Pierre Schaefer 
the French composer was doing. So what, what do you think um, is some of the causes of this erasure, particularly with a concrete example like uh, Halim, Halim El Dab's music? Um, I think this, this comes down to, you know, constructions in terms of what, what avant-garde, what electronic music is, um, and, and uh, you know, notions of, um, you know, there's, there's this notion of uh, people without history, um, which, um, you know, can be traced, which can be traced back at least, you know, back to, back to Hegel. Um, um, you know, um, um, the idea that um, someone from Egypt could possibly have conceived of um, electronic music before it was conceived in, um, in, in, in uh, you know, places or countries like France or, or uh, you know, Germany in the 1950s, uh, Studio für Elektronische Musik or so. Um, it's just, it's just, I think that that is something that, um, that is just uh, inconceivable to, or has been inconceivable to a lot of people, um, and um, and and this this has been remedied um, uh, recently. Um, so um, you know there have been conferences, and 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 also you know um, in Berlin, for instance, uh, of, um, a, a few few years ago, a few years ago, uh, Savvy Contemporary they staged. Um, events uh, centered um, um, on, on Halim al Dab's music to sort of reinsert, um, you know, important figures who were written out of these historical narratives back into the history of the music. Certainly to me, um, it, uh, I mean, this sort of like is linked to that quote by uh, Duplessis uh, of, of, of folks who are in positions of power prominence uh, who cannot fathom that Africans uh, or people of non-European background uh, can, you know, uh, can come up with these sorts of ideas uh, uh, or advance um, uh, uh, certain ideas. Um, just to touch on to John, do you have anything to add to that conversation, particularly from uh, a Thai perspective? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, that's a uh, highly male job is uh, that work is just wonderful. I didn't even know about it until a couple of years ago myself. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's pervasive that we've excluded so many composers outside of the Western world or the global North from the conversation and the narrative, you know, and then that's goes back to the idea that there are other traditions and other histories that we need to incorporate or I don't even know about what I say incorporate because that almost has a colonial feel too, right? It's, we, we don't need to extract their histories and put them into our history. We need to basically broaden our histories and uh, make them overlap all the others that are happening at the same time. And I think, I think the, the big issue is that there with technology, it's just, there were so many radio stations happening uh, you know that, that obviously that's where music contract grew out of right the 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 whole idea of radio technology and that uh Haile Amel Dab, the wire recorder he used it, itself was I think borrowed from uh, an Egyptian radio station so it's like why don't we start looking at the history of technology in various countries to find some of these composers that may have actually created works in other parts of the world outside of Europe because technology wasn't just in Europe, right? And I think we just have this very, uh, even just a Eurocentric history of, of what technology means with regards to how it's uh, spread throughout the world and how it's used. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad, but <laughs> it's, it's not unexpected, unfortunately. <laughs> I just want to go back to some of the themes of your presentation, uh, especially the, the historic um, part of it. Uh, when you touched on slavery and enslaved orchestras, I think sometimes um, our exposure um, to this uh, for most people is the trans transatlantic slave trade. That conversation, uh, I think, is, um, is, is very much highlighted. Um, because of how American culture tends to amplify itself around the world. And we are not really aware 
of slave cultures from around uh, from from other places in the world and the music thing that was going on there uh, i particularly was uh, i'm interested in uh, your enslaved orchestras if you can maybe talk about that a little bit more and the hybridity um, that comes out of that sort of like clash of cultures um, of people being forced um, to be together yeah so i I was getting ready to say I first discovered, but no, I didn't discover it. It's it, it first came to my attention that there were slave orchestras mainly through um, some uh, a concert, uh, a reporting of a concert uh, in the Jakarta Post about Indonesian slave orchestras, and that just blew my mind. And I thought, well, okay, that. I guess that makes sense because we we know that slaves have been forced to perform music for. The enslaved have been forced to uh, perform music for their their enslavers right at, all over the world uh, at least in the west but the thing is of course this was happening in indonesia and they were indonesian slaves so that was a part of um sort of an understanding uh, of the global tr uh, trade uh, slave trade from the standpoint of that part of the world and that there was the indian ocean slave trade and also the trans-pacific slave trade the earliest slaves uh, asian slaves in the americas were in uh the late 1500s and that came through the the Mil uh, manila galleon tr uh, trade and so finding that that reference to slave orchestras just that i just started looking everywhere you know looking through all the literature and eventually i would find little bits and pieces of references usually a sentence or two in in various sources to a slave orchestra in say you know sri lanka or south africa or uh, brazil or whatever basically pretty much every colonized part of the world had some form of slave ensemble orchestra sometimes choirs uh in some cases those i i read a reference to a slave orchestra being forced to perform an opera um so and then of course military bands concert bands uh so it's just it's widespread uh, and it's all over the world and i think that 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 global history of classical music because they were forced to perform beethoven and mozart and other lesser known classical composers, as well as some native, or uh, I want to say some native composers, I'm still finding very scant references to those, um, but composers within those colonized parts of the world as well. And I think that's a part of the narrative we don't really uh, understand, and obviously is, has just been excluded from our histories. And I think part of it is because it's an uncomfortable part of the history of classical music we don't want to talk about how people were forced to actually play classical music around the world uh for centuries uh, because the first i think the earliest reference i found was in manila um in 1594 um and the interesting thing is it said nine black slaves were brought to manila and at first i thought they may have been from mexico uh, Mexico City, because that was actually where there was there was actually a school for slave musicians there. Um, but now I've I've come to understand that they refer to anyone with dark skin in that part of the world. This included Indonesian South Asians uh, as black or uh, as as black basically, and so it could very well have been just a part of the Indian slave trade itself, and those may have been actually South Asian um as slaves so it's it's just a part of the history that we don't have as much information on and is is kind of understudied i i, I remember reading a just a a study on the references to like the indian ocean slave trade versus the transatlantic slave trade and how it's like in the the double digits as opposed to the many thousands of references in the scholarly literature for the uh, transatlantic slave trade of course that that did last a lot longer and that's an interesting part of the story in that those uh colonizers who were involved in the transatlantic slave trade wanted to stop the other slave trades because they were infringing on their ability to make money off of their you know their slaves so i it's it, it's it just opens up a completely different world and worldview on on the history of classical music i think and um how colonization slavery has basically affected the whole uh, well <laughs> just everything it, it's way too much to talk about in this yeah, 
<laughs> I, well, as I'm about to say, I mean, I think it's like a whole symposium by itself. Uh, mm -hmm. So I won't even insert my own comments about the, the Indian Ocean slave trade and how it affected uh, us here in Africa. I'm actually on the Indian Ocean's uh, I mean, in, in, on the Indian Ocean side of South Africa right now. Right, right. Um, just, just to go back, Harold, um, just to go back to, uh, I love this phrase that you used, Harold, called this cone of silence. Um, how, and you said that that's George Lewis's uh, quote. Um, can you expand more about how we can move forward um, you know, uh, get rid of that cone, cone of silence uh, mm -hmm. around uh, Black composers uh, and non-European composers in general? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so so um, I think it's important to look at it in terms of, um, I was I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about networks because, and, and, and perhaps that's because, um, uh, you know, it, it, it was announced yesterday that uh, Bruno Latour died, um, who's uh, you know uh, one of one of the founders of um, actor network theory. So, um, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking the lifting of the cone of silence. That's that's really something that works through networks. So, meaning, um, um, you know, uh, curators' curatorial decisions have to be internationalized. Um, uh, record labels um, need to need to make uh, commercially available um, recordings of, um, um, of of composers who are um, you know whose whose works don't get programmed in Europe, for instance. Um, 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 it, 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 um, research has to be done. Um, um, government funded agencies. Um, um, educational institutions and so forth uh, sort of have to have to broaden their horizons and have to um, have to include people who um, you know whose work has been understudied, underperformed, underrecorded to give us a full um, a full image, a full picture of the entire history of the music and. Uh, um, I like what John said um, several times about, you know, about um, uh, traditions or, or non-Western traditions of, um, um, of, 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 of composition or so, um, which if you take that into account, you get a much more, you get a much fuller, much more complex um, idea of what this music entails. And um, and 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 so I think that you know this is something that has to be done. Um, 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 you know, the music has to be performed. It has to be written about. Um, it has to be circulated um, in order to um, to create um, an awareness that this music is is significant and um, and that it exists. I just before I. Uh... I, I asked the panel more questions. I just want to remind uh, folks who are uh, listening to this that you can actually start posting your questions uh, for the Q&A after, if you can just post your questions in the chat um, so that uh, they will get through to the panelists. Um, Harold, your comments to me sort of like signify a systemic problem. Uh, that you know, this this is system wide. This exclusion of people um, and, and this discrimination, and isn't ra rather than um, you know first um, you know uh, doing the the suggestions that you have made. I'm, I'm wondering, is it not necessary to first educate people that systemic. Uh, issues exist, um, like you know, systemic racism, for instance, exists. I mean, that's what we understood here in South Africa. Uh, we knew that uh, there are certain um, attitudes, white supremacist attitudes, as uh, exemplified then by quote by by Hubert de Plessis, that composers that in people's mind. Uh, European culture is superior, and other cultures, especially African culture, um, is not worthy of, of a further examination or, uh, or, or research or, um, or, or, or any sort of like um, uh, intellectual exploration. 
isn't that the issue? And 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 here I'm 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 minded to call uh, to to recall uh, Saul Bellows, the American um, author, who was quoted, you know, as saying like, if the Zulus produce their toy, the, the Tolstoy, I will read it. I mean, these are systemic, mm-hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> you know, um, a, a prejudice that exists, is it not? It is. No, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. And of course, this has to go hand in hand. Um, so I think it's, it's very, it's very important to address that. And, and, you know, part of, of course, part of the, you know, the research, part of the scholarly work is about addressing just that, what you, what you just mentioned. Um, there's this idea of, you know, you could call it white supremacy, you can call it it's it, that there, there's this there's this notion of you know Western European classical music as something that is exceptional, um, whereas you know um, something that is that is not associated with it it's 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 something that can never even come close. Um, so um, and the quote um, you know the quote about. Um, uh, about South African music, um, you know, n- never be able to um, to 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 uh, you know um, mix with Western classical tradition because it's you know it's so vastly um, uh, inferior. It's just uh, that's just another. I think it's just another way of expressing that. Um, so and, and and it's also about you know this 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 idea of. Um, um, Basically, losing something like you know superiority in terms of 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 of, uh, of aesthetic authority, aesthetic distinction, um, which I think all comes down to um, um, you know this idea of an assumed uh, position of of of, of authority um, and superiority, and um, but but um, you are you are absolutely right. I think. This this has to go hand in hand with, or this is part of, you know, to to again uh, use this this phrase uh, from George Lewis. Um, this is part of uh, uh, lifting the cone of silence. Yeah. Uh, John, um, have you got anything to add there? I mean, uh, w- one of the things that's going through my mind is Harold was talking about. Uh, you know this the sort of hierarch, cultural hierarchy here um, with, that European thinking seems to, to dwell upon is uh, even uh, fundamental things of how music is produced in terms of tuning uh, scales and and, and, uh, and just basically all the theoretical um, fundamentals. Um, uh, you know we've always been, um, I think, directed to think that the Western um, uh, side of thing is, 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 is the norm, is the standard. I mean, you coming from an Asian perspective there, what do you think can be done to uh, sort of like advance inclusion in the, just in terms of the, the theoretical approach to music, how we, we look at it, how we make it, uh, how we compose? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's 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 a good question uh, because uh, one of the other research projects I've been doing is doing a uh, a survey like of different curricula in especially non-Western countries, many of which have uh, what I tend to refer to as either bi or poly musical uh, ed- education ecosystems. Um, like in Thailand, they they you can actually you know go and major in Western music, but you can also go and major in Thai music. And so you have this whole curricula that's de- uh, devoted to Thai classical music and that tradition. So you'll take the theory courses, you'll take the composition courses, you'll take the um, the history courses, all geared specifically towards Thai classical music and that tradition. And you find this in many, many countries outside of the West, whereas the West generally is very, very Eurocentric. And that's, that's about it. If there is another program, it may be jazz, possibly maybe a pop music program. But you know that's still um that's still at least within the realm of western music it, not necessarily classical but um but definitely you unless you have an ethnomusicology department and that's the that's the other side of the coin is that we have this field ethnomusicology where all the non-western music goes and then we have the regular music department where the western music goes right which is considered the new neutral universal so exactly the, the idea of hierarchies and i think 
coming to uh, an understanding that there are other ways of teaching music and that there are other countries that are doing it already uh, could be very instructive for educators who are looking to diversify um, their curricula or even their repertoire, uh, because then you start to think, well, is there a Thai orchestra in the area that I can maybe compose for? Or is there, uh, you know, uh, a Tarab orchestra I can compose for or whatever? Um, and that there are actually composers writing for those groups and that are living that have nothing at all to do and don't overlap the Western canon. Okay, just a wrap up uh, so, so sort of thought, and I'm going to pose this to both of you. And actually, it stems from um, from Harold's presentation. Uh, Harold mentioned um, the concert that Vimbaya Casabona conducted uh, with with all these uh, uh, fantastic composers, Andy Lukumalo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what other curatorial interventions do you think are needed? Or have you got ideas of other curatorial interventions, Harold, um, that can, I think, help uh, promote more inclusion? Harold? Yeah. Um, um, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about music conservatories, for instance, um, I'm, because that, you know, that's a field, um, you know, because I, I, you know, I teach, uh, I teach quite a bit. And um, for instance, last semester, I taught a class on um, the intersection between jazz and, um, and contemporary music. And, and I started assigning readings, which are related to what we are discussing today. And I also, um, we also talked about some of the composers whom I had mentioned in my presentation. And so, um, and, 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 and so what I noticed is there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of interest in terms of, on the side of students to uh, learn more about that. Um, and, and, and also this idea, that, you know, this is something that I had never heard of, uh, something that, something that was, you know, um, not something that was denied, but something that was, that was withheld from me. And um, so it was, it was, you know, it was like a, um, was a very um, revealing moment, um, both for the students and, 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 and for myself. And, um, you know, I think, Besides the curatorial aspect, um, I think education is is very very different because this is a generation who, um, you know, in terms of that's at least based on my experience in terms of, um, you know, issues such as as um, systemic racism, um, is much more critical compared to um, you know previous generations, and um, and um, a lot of students are, are, are interesting in these issues, you know, like decolonization, um, um, decentered approaches in terms of, you know, music traditions and things like that. So um, to me, that's that's really critical. I think you, you're quite right that uh, the, the I mean, beginning of the conservatory uh, at um, at the learning level, uh, these interventions need to be made then rather than later with festivals and all that. That's important as well. You remind me of an example that uh, uh, Professor Kofi Agao gave um, in, a, in a different panel I was on. Um, we were talking about African composers. And he, as a musicologist and a theorist, uh, was saying that I mean, there's this... Um, this anthology, this five-volume anthology published by Oxford University Press, compiled by William Chapman Yaho on African piano music. And Halim El Dab is there, some of my work is there, et cetera. And uh, <laughs> what Kofi was saying is that, guys, you know, in, in, in your harmony and analysis course, why don't you assign some of these works there? Instead of like giving them notes or whatever, give them a piece by Ali Maldab, piano piece to start analyzing. Um, just to close off, um, uh, uh, John, do you have any uh, brief comments to make, uh, especially on the on the issue of, in, of intervention at, at that level of education? Yeah, I think the the 
intervention at the level of education is, is very important. And I think it can, it can go even earlier, obviously, into, into the grade, into grade school, K through 12. Uh, kids are very open to things like this. And um, there are one of the other things I research is other uh, like alternative music education systems in the US. Um, and there are programs that start like in on the West Coast, Chinese music programs, which you can start learning a Chinese instrument in the grade school level you know, go all the way to, to graduate with it. And then there's a local college that actually teaches Chinese music. And there are a dozen or more ensembles and orchestras, Chinese traditional orchestras in the San Francisco Bay Area that they can then perform in if they want to afterwards. Um, so, you know, there are models out there. It's just, they, I think we just need to let people uh, know that they exist, let them be, be aware of that, because then... Obviously, I don't want them to say uh, I don't want someone to just become a, uh, a colonialist and say, oh, yes, let's extract these resources and then use it in my classroom. Right. Um, but then maybe hiring someone that actually is a culture bearer to come in and teach rather than saying, OK, I can just look at this and and learn it myself and then teach it to my students. You know, I think that helps to bring uh, outsiders in, right? And I think um, just, there are just so many things that could be done about the education system in general that can help with that. Thank you so much to both of you uh, for this conversation. I mean, we could have gone on for an hour and we've actually really uh, eaten into our time for Q&A, uh, but thank you, Harold, and thank you, John. I mean, this was just such a, a stimulating conversation for me. Um, now I'm going to hand over back to Jorg uh, in Boston. Um, so goodbye from me in South Africa as uh, the chair of this panel for now. And I'll now just take questions and Jorg is going to lead the Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this very inspiring conversation. Um, we have um, at that time two comments or remarks or question. Um, the first um, is directly to you, you three panelists, and um, you're going to be asked whether uh, your positionality affect your research analysis and data collection. Um, I understand the question that person, positionality is meant like something like your descent or the, the, where you're coming from or where you belong to. Um, um, maybe you take this question and make some remarks about that. Who wants to start? I'll start. I'll start. <laughs> okay, John. Oh, yes. Most definitely my positionality has uh, uh, affected how I do what well for one, what I research and how I do the research, uh, because growing up, uh, I was born in Thailand, but I grew up mostly in the States and growing up in the States in a, uh, a biracial household, we, uh, we listened to a lot of Thai music and that was what I grew up listening to. And before I started learning how to play the cello, uh, I learned how to sing songs in Thai. And so, um, but eventually assimilative, uh, assimilative pressures, assimilative pressures started to creep in because, you know, all the other kids were listening to either Western pop music, uh, American pop music, or or classical music. Once I started getting into that uh, into that track, and so I slowly that's the the Thai side of my uh, musical background sort of faded away, and um, I and I started to get the feeling that you know the classical music was superior. It was this this is music. I remember at one point I actually. Um, I think I may have been in junior high school. I started to think that my mother was singing out of tune because it wasn't the same pitch system that we use in, in Western classical music. And that was, it wasn't until years later, I realized, oh yeah, I, I was definitely, I definitely got colonized <laughs> and, and musically colonized uh, because, you know, there was nothing out of tune. Which just, she sings beautifully and I love her singing and I, li I listen to it all the time now. Uh, and because of the work I do now, uh, I actually have started my own intercultural orchestra where I actually perform music from Southeast Asia and Thailand so that I can actually revisit and come back to my own 
uh, cultural heritage. And of course, that inf uh, inflects the way that I do research as well, to because obviously looking at these uh, systems of education in other countries, but especially Southeast Asia, and just using that as a counterpoint to how we are trained here in the States, especially, uh, has been very, very, I think, instructive and important. So definitely my, my biracial background and by musical background has had, had a big impact on my positionality. Thank you for that. Some other uh, remarks, Harold or Bungani to that question? Hi, can I just jump in quickly? Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll just jump in quickly with a quote from uh, Professor Papia Gao that you wrote uh, uh, on this article called The Challenge of African Art Music. Um, and he says that the African composer's heritage, typically multiple rather than singular, influences come from outside and inside from Europe and Africa. But while a composer's upbringing may include exposure to various sorts of traditional popular music, the moment of writing uh, or the moment in which the compositional faculty is exercised is often decisively shaped by an aspect of European practice. Uh, this is typical for most African composers, everybody from Akina, Yuba, Jesh, Kaben, and Kintia, because we are brought up um, in, in the system of, uh, that we inherited with missionization uh, and colonialism, where um, you know, you, in the formal setting, you get taught European music, but in the domestic situation at home, you grow up with African music around your home um, in, um, in uh, it also sorts of like traditional context, et cetera. So we are dealing here with this multiple rather than singular uh, so sort of influences from the African perspective anyway. Yeah, thank you for this statement, Bungani. Harold, do you want to add something? Um, I think uh, it has mostly, you know, it has mostly been um, voiced by, by, by John and, 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 and Bongani. I don't think I have anything okay. substantial to add at this point. No, no problem. So we can go uh, to uh, a remark or command from Anthony. And um, he is... Um, saying that he's curious about your thoughts concerning the reality that no matter how much information is revealed to contemporary audiences, the celebration of and study of white male European composers will always have 100 to 200 years of brewing within the collective consciousness of classical music culture. And how do we fight this? Uh, important question. Who wants to take it up? Bongani, you seem to want to start or? Uh, you have to put your microphone on, please. Hi, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I do know Anthony is a dear friend and a wonderful composer and a provocateur as well. Um, and uh, I mean, he's, he's, he's quite correct that um, there has been this uh, exclusion uh, of folks, um, and but we are beginning, though I think, to see um, uh, a move away from that um, uh, that way of thinking. I'm reminded here by um, um, uh, is it uh, Professor Philip Ewell's article on you know uh, racism in music theory. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is a problem that exists. I don't know if there's a solution. So I think we've tried to um, to hint at some in terms of education, in terms of interventions, curation. Uh, but it, but we have this. I think we have this this legacy, uh, which uh, basically is this culture dominated by white men uh, for two hundred years, um, and we have to find ways. I think. Of, of how do we move forward with that? We, we, can't, we can't just ban people. That's the other thing is that, okay, we won't, we won't play Beethoven for a year. I don't think that's really constructive. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my comment, I suppose. Uh, somebody else can come in. John or Harold, do you want to comment on this? 
issue or topic? Um, it, it was it was a it was also a bit it was a bit hard for me to um to hear what um uh, Bongani said um so um so hopefully I'm not um uh, I'm not you know sort of reproducing what you just said uh, Bongani but um um I think in my in my presentation I spoke about you know the possibility of of, of changes to the identity matrix of you know what is considered classical music or contemporary music, and um, and a, a lot of what John said um, um, was you know was was important in that regard as well. I think because um, the the um, the idea of the the, the notion um, of, of of classical music seemed to be in flux, and um, and um, um, and I think this is, you know, this is a moment where, where you know, real fundamental changes to um, the notion of what this music is, what this music constitutes, um, uh, can be made. And so I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm aware and mindful of, um, of, um, you know, the the the, the lack of of, of one hundred or two hundred years. But I'm also hopeful that um, you know a lot of a lot of ground can be uh, can be gained. Good, John. Do you want to add something to that? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, agree with everything um, Bongani and Harold said. Um, the a lot of what I do, of course, is just to. I think of myself as more of a a curator of. Uh, obscure information about classical music um, in some ways, because uh, obviously we don't think about looking at slave orchestras as a way to study classical music history, right? Um, but uh, some of the things I do, at least like on my research, my my blog and my research, and is to just like, I have a list of Europe uh, Baroque composers outside of Europe. That's just one of the many things I have on my blog, which just lists composers from South America, um, a lot from Asia, uh, a few from Africa. And then I also have another list of um, Black composers from the 5th century to the 15th century. And so basically the idea that composition existed outside of Europe is an important idea to to highlight because that goes to, uh, on to the uh, the idea that there are other composition traditions and then eventually once we get to the modern the early modern era that those traditions start to overlap a lot more and start to interact and um so i think it's just the the understanding that there is a lot of history centuries of history even a millennia of history of composition outside of europe um that just is basically excluded and we can talk about the reasons for that um but i think they over uh, there are a lot of different reasons that overlap and some of that of course is just the superior the idea of cultural superiority of european music and music hi and history and then you know obviously a lot of the uncomfortable truths that come up when we start looking at the histories of those other countries because of how europe has colonized so much of the world so I think it's just a matter of access to this information that we need to understand that it's out there, it's happened, but it's not being shared yet. And that's where we need, it goes back to the education thing. We need to start educating at a much earlier uh, level than just the, than, than a college level. And of course, even modern audiences too, so. Yeah, thanks for that, John. Um, maybe we move on uh, to a comment from Daniel coming up a little bit earlier, and he's saying um, there has been discussion as to system, systemic nature of the accession of European cultural superior, superiority, but doesn't this start also with the fact that classical music is part of that structure and making this fact as clear as possible is only the first step how do people of color approach being involved with being stuck in this historical structure? So important remark and question. Who's going to take this up?
Well, I'll go ahead and <laughs> <laughs> John. I'll, just, I'll just continue on with what I was saying. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I think um, understanding that people that look like us have been composing music for centuries is a big first step because um and understanding that we have been excluded from that history is the second step so um how to get past the systemic issues th that's the hard one because that, that's not something individual individually we can control um we can only you know do what we can where we are and 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 share what we can and hopefully present music ourselves even because that's like i said i uh, with my intercultural orchestra we we perform music uh we don't I don't think we, I think we've performed maybe one uh, composition by someone from the global north. All the rest of the music is is from Southeast Asia, the Middle East, uh, Turkey, uh, Central Asia. So, um, and of course, a lot of modern compositions, stuff that isn't normally performed. And I think, you know, organizations just have to be comfortable with doing that type of curation with their programming. Um, to help show that composition wasn't just purely a European and North American and global North thing. And um, to show that there have been composers all around the world and, and who knows who we may inspire as a result of that. Yeah. Thank you, John, somebody else trying to pick up that. No. So, I mean, for me, just to add, um, uh, this conversation for me has highlighted the importance of education. And I think that intervention is, I think is much more effective than later interventions when it comes to curation and all those kinds of big things like concert halls, et cetera. It seems like there, is, there needs to be something in the curriculum as people design curriculums. Uh, around this, because um, people don't just arrive at the notion that you know uh, Western European music is superior; they 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 are enculturated into that thinking. Okay, so I think the more we address that culture, and as for me, it just seems that it has to be done at a very primary level um, of education, and uh, it's just important that. Uh, these ideas are sort of like nipped in the bud very quickly um, at, at that level. Mm -hmm. Harold, anything to add to that? Otherwise, I'll take uh, two questions out of out of the chat. Um, there are <laughs> some more interesting, more comments and remarks. And because we are running out of time a little bit, I just want to take these two questions. Right. Uh, the one is coming from Scott, and he says, uh, in addition to our kind of around issues of biomusicality, are we in a moment when we are re-inscribing identities as fixed? I ask because in the 1990s, it was important to assert identity as a fluid notion. Has it changed in your opinion? What do you think about that? Well, I mean, there's this, there's this, no, you know, there's this um, um, Gertrude Spivak's notion of, uh, um, you know, it's of, of, um, strategic essentialism in terms of of, um, of identities, and I think you know that she may have she may have advanced this idea in the '90s. So I'm not I'm not quite sure, but but. Um, but um, I mean, to me, it's not about it's not about fixity in terms of identity. To me, to me, it's more about. I think John used the term hybridity. Um, I think I think um, interesting an interesting term in this regard is also uh, the term uh, creolization. Um, you know, which which uh, designates a cultural dynamic, which um, you know, which is which is which which aims at. There's this um, um, there's this manifesto by um, um, uh, Patrick Chamoiseau and and um, uh, Raphael Confion and um, um, Patrick Barnabé um, where they say you know this is about annihilation of um, of um, um, 
monolingualism and um and um uh, and and purity uh things like that and and i think you know a lot of what has been said today um highlight actually highlights that um 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 you know the 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 the, the coming together of um um uh, various um uh, uh, cultural influences um um which which are you know antithetical to 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 any notions of 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 you know uh, fixed or uh, essential identities in terms of you know sonic markers in terms of what um you know particular type of music is supposed to sound like or so hmm. thank you uh something else to scott's remark otherwise maybe we can pick up a last question which seems to be important to me as well coming from Jaume I hope I say that right uh, and he says could you briefly talk about the presence of female composers through the entire pros process of your research who wants to take that up oh I'll, I'll... I'll take that one up because uh, that's actually been uh, uh, an important concern with me and my intercultural orchestra is that uh, eventually, you know, obviously we were already um, working with composers outside of the Western canon and outside of basically European and North and North American composition. Um, but because I have I've studied like Middle Eastern music for quite a while. I, I first started uh, doing that in 2004. And so I, you know, I, I drummed with several uh, uh, Middle Eastern groups, whether it be Arabic groups or, or Turkish with Turkish musicians or uh, musicians from cent Central Asia and so those overlapping cultures. So I've come to learn some of the repertoire and there are actually a number of composers within some of those uh, traditions that are women and are considered a part of those canons. And I think that's really interesting. So what I do with my intercultural orchestra is that uh, basically I, I, I try to have a, a, a fairly even balance of, of men and women composers on all the programs we do. And, and, you know, sometimes it's difficult because finding the biggest issue with the intercultural orchestra is I have to arrange everything for the group. So <clears throat> first finding an actual score or a good recording that I can transcribe from becomes uh, a, a big part of the issue. And that, you know, this is a completely side issue to um, the, the, the gender issue. So I do like to incorporate uh, as much music by women as possible. And, and I think that's important too, because it's, it's, also another neglected part of uh, the the history of inclusion and so yeah Bungani if or I just, if i can just jump in quickly the um and just to talk about our specific project that um uh, post-colonial research that we're doing with ensemble research and goethe institute um we as a selection panel um we um you know, we 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 uh, we set it as our goal that we should include um, uh, gender as one of the criteria. Look out specifically for women composers, and I think out of the ten um, the composers from the global south that we have, um, we have one um, woman composer from South Africa. I think whose work might have been performed yesterday by Ensemble Recherche at Harvard. Um, we have one Iranian woman composer um, doing extraordinary things um, around um, uh, notation of Iranian music. Um, we have a composer from a woman composer from Argentina also involved in the project, um, and another one um, I think from Peru. Um, all doing very interesting things that are based from their uh, culture, especially the, the pre-colonial um, period of their of their culture. Um, and, and yes, I think we have to, I, I think if you are in a, in a curatorial position, um, I think these are things that you've got to watch out for, um, apart from artistic merit, you have to ask yourself, you know, how, how, how inclusive is my programming? You know, where are the women composers, where are the black composers, that kind of thing. Um, and I, and I think we, we must constantly be aware of that, uh, in our selection. Harold, something to add? Yes, I, I would just like to add that um, the co-edited vol volume that I'm currently working on with George Lewis, uh, you know, 50% of the Afro-Diasporic composers are going to be um, 
women composers in that book. And I mentioned um, Hannah Kendall, um, who, you know, a few months ago won the Paul Hindemith uh, Prize. Um, and she was the first black composer uh, to to win that prize. And, um, you know, I, I, I had the honor of, um, of giving um, the Laudatio, um, uh, you know, laudatory speech for her. And in, in my in my Laudatio, I mentioned that this is something that um, that she you know she mentioned a while ago um, um, when she was when she was growing up um, there were no role models so she didn't know of of any uh, uh, um, composers who looked like her um, she didn't know any black composers she 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 didn't know that you know um, um, women composers existed up you know up to a certain point in time. Um, and so, you know, the issue of, of intersectionality is really important here. So it's about lifting, you know, two cones of silence in a way, simultaneously. Yeah. Hmm. Wow, that was a, a lot of things to talk about. And I got the feeling we could go on forever <laughs> or no, for, for much more hours because it's so complex and so interesting. Before I speak some final words, uh, Bongani, do you want to wrap up a little bit um you did it already i think when you were commenting on the importance of education you, you want to say a few more words to make a conclusion or something like that although we know it's very hard to make a conclusion on this complex topic uh, no no I, i won't make a conclusion at all because I, i think just the conversation was just so stimulating and i mean i just uh walking away from this with a lot of uh, to think about but I just want to plug the concert tomorrow evening uh, some of the composers I talked about um, will be in, in the concert tomorrow evening and I think Annette has put up the link um, in the chat room so if you're in the Boston area please do come to that concert and see some of the uh, the work um, that these composers have been working on as part of this project post-colonial research thank you Thank you for that, Bungani. So that's up to me to say thanks a lot to you, Bungani, Harold, and John for this inspiring conversation. And thanks to the audience for your participation. Uh, this panel will be published, as I said, soon on our website, if you will recommend it to others who might be interested and if you want to look it up for yourself. Let me remind you that we have a second online panel tomorrow morning at 11 EST with interesting presentations of the ICE Ensemble from New York done by George Lewis, as we said before, uh, Castle of Our Skins by Ashley Gordon and the Ensemble Research Project we were talking about from Freiburg, Germany by Bongani and Clemens. I hope to see you soon. And once again, thank you for this inspiring panel and hope to see you soon at any occasion. Goodbye.